Yeah, thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I feel I have a, a kind of strange position here as I'm introducing, sorry. Yeah, yeah, great. As I'm introducing someone who is uh, not here present in real life and I uh, have the task of uh, kind of giving a response to it and also involve you later in, uh, in the discussion. Um, I'll keep the introduction really short and um, uh, say the rest of the things after that. Um, so TJ Damos, this presentation is called Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Chaturocene, the many names of resistance and that already gives a lot away uh, about what he will be talking about in, um, in his presentation. Uh, TJ Damos is professor in the Department of History of Art and Visual Culture in, at the University of California in Santa Cruz and he's founder and director of uh, the Center of Creative Ecologies there. Uh, he writes widely on the intersection of contemporary art, global politics and ecology and uh, as you already saw he's the author of the book uh, Decolonizing Nature, Nature, Contemporary Art and the Polit Politics of Ecology which really zooms into the much more central position that ecology has uh, taken in the arts in the practice of the arts, in any case, maybe not in art criticism or in, in art theory. He's also the author earlier of uh, The Migrant Image, The Art and Politics of Documentary During Global Crisis and the Return uh, to the Post-Colony. Um, he co-curated uh, Rights of Nature, Art and Ecology in the Americas, that was in Nottingham, and there's a forthcoming book from him, him which is called uh, Against the Anthropocene, Visual Culture and Environment Today. And the presentation that you're about to see uh, really dives exactly into that subject. Um, so I propose to start the presentation now. The Anthropocene thesis can be roundly criticized for its assorted failings, terminological, philosophical, ecological, political. In my forthcoming book, Against the Anthropocene, I detail these problems in relation to popular websites. I investigate the term's tendency to disavow responsibility, generalizing the historical causes of climate change, and likewise failing to differentiate its effects, a move that flies in the face of climate justice. The problem is also that the Anthropocene thesis regresses to human exceptionalism in an age of multi-species mutuality and offers an ideological mechanism of choice by advocates of geoengineering who posit technofixes as the necessary solution to catastrophic climate change. They fail to see the origins of environmental transformation in the long history of fossil fuel capitalism. Nonetheless, the Anthropocene thesis remains significant for one reason. It registers the geological impact of colonial and industrial activities on Earth's natural systems. As such, it offers an important wedge, one that unites climate science and environmental studies with the environmental arts and humanities against climate change denial, funded generously by the destructive profiteering fossil fuel industry. And now, with the momentum of its growing adoption across diverse fields of science, academic work, cultural and artistic practice, the term Anthropocene is likely here to stay, especially with its official endorsement by the International Union of Geological Sciences in 2016. Still, there are other contenders for geopolitical descriptors, among them the Capitalocene, the Age of Capital, which has the advantage of naming the culprit, sourcing climate change not in human species being, but within the global scale, world historical, and political economic organization of modern capitalism, stretched over centuries of enclosures, colonialisms, industrializations, and globalizations. Considering its 15th century origins, Nick Mirzoff writes, the Anthropocene began with a massive colonial genocide, Yet why not acknowledge that history in the term itself? The Capitalocene thesis foregrounds how capitalism evolved within and against nature's web of life, as well as brought ecological transformations to it. 
In other words, the crisis of climate change owes not simply to a substance like coal or oil or to a chemical element like carbon, but to complex socioeconomic, political, and material operations involving classes and commodities, imperialisms and empires, and biotechnology and militarism. As an aside, Investigating the visual cultures of extraction, one of the key elements of the capitalist scene is the subject of a current Center for Creative Ecologies research project taking place over the winter and spring of 2017, comprising an artist screening and lecture series, a number of research field trips to sites of material and labor extraction, and a two-day conference in May. If you're interested, please check out the website of the Center for Creative Ecologies, which I direct at UC Santa Cruz. This terminological choice, whether Anthropocene or Capitalocene, is not simply a matter of semantics, but of historical truth, as well as a prospective and transformative justice. To pursue an effective transition toward a post-fossil fuel future that is socially and politically just, and to create a common world in which all will not be blamed for the activities of the few, and where culpability for ecocide is assigned to those responsible, so that a livable future becomes not only possible, but guaranteed. That said, no doubt we need many names to account for the sheer complexity and multiple dimensionality of this geopolitico-economic formation, as well as to identify effective resources of resistance and inspire emergent cultures of survival. If so, then another readily available candidate is the Thulucene, a proposal of Donna Haraway's that draws on the resources of science fiction as much as science fact, speculative feminism as much as speculative fabulation, in naming our present age of multi-species interactions, non-patriarchal becomings, and generative collaborations. Distinct from sci-fi writer H.P. Lovecraft's malevolent dragon-octopus-anthropos-shaped monster named Thulu, Haraway's neologism is proposed rather as a name of names with a thick and global mythological genealogy. It references the diverse earth-wide tentacular powers and forces uh, and collected things with names like Naga, Gaia, Tangaroa, Terra, Haniyasu, Hime, Spider-Woman, Pachamama, and many, many more. The Thulucine, from the Greek Kthan, or the Thonic Ones, and the Now of Kainos, suggests myriad temporalities and spatialities and myriad intraactive entities and assemblages, including the more than human, other than human, inhuman, and human as humus as Haraway explains. Such is the post-anthropocentric, non-human exceptionalist, and post-individualist basis for Haraway's rejection of the Anthropocene's regressive figuration, and equally the Capitalocene's insufferable reality. Both, for her, are mired in cynicism, defeatism, and game-over rhetoric, or alternately, an irresponsible or non-response-able, looking-away kind of techno-utopianism. Contrary to the essentializing figure of Anthropos, which assumes the human to be the self-sufficient, singular, and discrete sovereign of its world, the Thulucine conceptualization reveals the distributed, entangled, and interconnected agencies involved in climate chaos as much as its antidote, the condition of life's ongoingness. Haraway's theorization finds creative approximations in the collaborative and interdisciplinary projects such as the Crochet Coral Reef of Christine and Margaret Wertheim, defining a sympoetic nodding of hyperbolic spatial mathematics, marine biology, environmental activism, ecological consciousness raising, women's handicrafts, a fiber arts, museum display, and community arts practice. Or there's the cosmopolitics of Navajo Diné weaving in Arizona's Black Mesa territory, where the wool of churro sheep 
is used to materialize animal-human relations of responsibility in the wake of colonial oppression and in the current extraction sacrifice zones of excess death and threatened ongoingness of life. There's also Beatrice de Costa's Pigeon Blog, a work embracing companion species and techno-organic hybridity to address environmental justice in California and to repair blighted neighborhoods and social relations. These are all remarkable examples of ecological arts, creative ecologies of practice based in cross-species and mutual care, interdisciplinary collaboration, and long-term post-colonial and environmentalist engagements occurring beyond the walls of conventional art institutions and commercial art markets. They outline the necessary ethics of responsibility and the skilled capacities for survival on a damaged planet that comprise so many ecologies of practice, joining interspecies justice, ethical mutuality, and sustainable co-belonging. Additionally, and not unrelated to the Thulucene, is the Gynothene thesis. Uh, the Gynocene implies a gender-equalized, feminist-led, anti-anthropos environmentalism, which locates human-caused geological violence as coextensive with patriarchal domination, linking ecocide and gynocide. We declare the imperative necessity for a new geological era to be commenced before the Anthropocene is even officially admitted on that scale. And it might be that by the time it gets fully acknowledged, it will be too late. Rather than continue to contemplate our annihilation, contributing to it, or declaring hopelessness in front of it, we should at least try another approach. And this approach has to exclude patriarchy and all its expressions and institutionalized forms of violence, domination, exploitation, slavery, colonialism, profit, exclusion, monarchy, oligarchy, mafia, religious wars. Contesting the ravages of Anthropos and equally the inequalities of capitalist rule, the Gynocene Manifesto calls for new models of eco-feminist stewardship resonating in part with indigenous post-colonial reverence for Mother Earth or Pachamama as set within the multifaceted rights of nature mobilizations that have occurred recently in South America. There, indigenous practices of living and cultivating the forests, lands, and rivers over more than 13,000 years contrast with the natural cultural plunder practiced by globally networked high-tech colonial and industrial societies, which over five centuries of colonialism and globalization have brought the biological biological, physical, cultural, and human measures of Amazonia to a devastating crisis point. The present movement of indigenous-led environmentalism is spreading rapidly, even evidenced in the People's Climate March in New York City on September 21, 2014, which, drawing together more than 300,000 participants, was the largest such demonstration in history. Protesters converged under banners, such as Oakland-based artist and climate justice activist Fabiana Rodriguez's Defend Our Mother, depicting a Latina-appearing Earth Mother in folk art style, her head haloed by our flowering planet, its title resonating with the Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth at Cochabamba, and with frontline communities, such as those at Standing Rock in North Dakota, struggling against the ravages of fossil fuel infrastructure and environmental racism, following upon centuries of colonial genocide in the Americas. The Earth is Mother, a figure of the Pachamamacina, also links to post-heteronormative, eco-sexualist care for the Earth as lover, as appearing in the carnivalesque Earth marriage ceremonies of performance artists and activists Beth Stevens and Annie Sprinkle. They deploy matrimony as a radical act against environmental destruction and earth love as a retort to ecocide. We are madly, passionately, and fiercely in love, and we are grateful for this relationship each and every day. 
We are aquaphiles, terrophiles, pyrophiles, and aerophiles. We shamelessly hug trees, massage the earth with our feet, and talk erotically to plants. We are artists, academics, sex workers, sexologists, healers, environmental activists, nature fetishists, gardeners, business people, therapists, lawyers, peace activists, eco-feminists, scientists, educators, revolutionaries and evolutionaries, critters and other entities from diverse walks of life. Ecosexuals can be GLBTQI, heterosexual, asexual, and or other. We will save the mountains, waters, and skies by any means necessary, especially through love, joy, and our powers of seduction. With their film Goodbye Golly Mountain, an ecosexual love story, Stevens and Spreekel mobilized documentary practice to investigate devastating mountaintop removal, uh, a kind of mining that occurs in West Virginia, where Stevens grew up. Shown smelling flowers, massaging river stones, lasciviously licking and hugging trees, bathing nude, and luxuriating in mud. The artist's joyful celebration of the natural world, where nature figures as an awe-inspiring sight of queer becoming and radical indeterminacy, rather than any kind of essentialist ideal or non-human purity or wilderness, is nothing but infectious. Sprinkle and Stevens juxtapose anti-mining civil disobedience, unexpected alliance formation, and inspiring activist community building to the horrific blasting of mountaintops, the ecocidal destruction of streams and aquifers, and testimonies of corporate deceit, their loving ecosexual romance modeling a refreshingly libidinal way of being political. Another alternative to the Anthropocene is the Plantationocene. As a subcategory of the Capitalocene, it highlights the plantation system, and particularly its nexus of corporate colonialism, quasi or explicit slave labor, and the commodification of nature as a structural cause of geological transformation, including the 18th and 19th century Spanish-led colonization of California, the Belgian rubber plantations in late 19th century Congo, and the current sites of biogenetically assisted industrial agriculture in Argentina, India, and Indonesia. The plantation system intensifies the oppression of women and the regimentation of normative racial and gender codes, and suppressed interspecies co-becomings and nature-cultural mutualities, as the anthropologist Anna Singh observes. As such, it brings to mind the homogenocene, the epoch of genetically and industrially induced monocultures, at, at the cost of mass extinctions, identifying the de-biodiversifying effects of globalization's reduction of natures to the commodity form via corporate extractive, extractivist strip mining, oil drilling, monocrop planting, dam building, neoliberalism. And then, there is the plant Plasticine, the age of plastic, which, as Heather Davis argues, figures as perhaps the most exemplary material substrata of living and dying in contemporary capitalism. Indeed, there is so much plastic in our landfills, waste dumps, rivers, and oceans that micropolymer particles, the kind used commonly in toothpaste and cosmetics, have become omnipresent, found to have made a home even in the most remote deep sea sites, even before initial human exploration. We can expect traces of the material to last in the fossil records for millennia to come. Expressive of the fantasy of unending economic growth, the material is seemingly death-defying quality, for it takes tens of thousands of years for plastic to dissolve, is made possible by its petrochemical basis, which also indicates the permanency of its environmental devastation. Ubiquitous in consumer society, its production is only set to grow. While 280 million tons of plastic were produced in 2012, it is expected to rise to 33 billion by 2050. We are literally transforming our environment into plastic. All of the terms discussed above, and there are still many more, 
provide urgently needed conceptual tools to test, rethink, and theoretically challenge the Anthropocene thesis. One additional problem with the term is what sociologist Jason Moore refers to as its consequentialist bias, meaning its tendency to focus on the effects of climate change, such as global warming, CO2 pollution, sea level rise, drought, and so on, while ignoring the structural causes. What Moore analyzes is the formation over centuries of capitalism in nature and nature in capitalism. In this regard, Bill McKibben's recent analysis of climate change's so-called world war appears, in my view, conceptually misguided and politically questionable. It's not climate change or nature or carbon that is the enemy, as McKibben's confusion of cause and effect has it, but rather the world historical system that has produced them. The capitalist scene proposition locates the origin of the crisis in capitalism's exploitative relations to labor, food, energy, and raw materials. These figure as so many cheap natures, according to Moore, which, after centuries of exploitation, are now no longer easily available, as there are no more new frontiers and peoples to conquer only ever more extreme forms of, of extraction, such as Arctic fossil fuel exploration, fracking for dirt, dirty oil, deep sea drilling, and redoubled but ever precarious modes of military resource wars and global interventions. This situation leaves us with a choice, either an Anthropocene, Capitalocene future of extreme geoengineering in an age of climate change catastrophe, ruled by centrist and increasingly authoritative governments uh, and their repressive militarized police forces alongside ever heightening forms of socioeconomic and political inequality. This future is foretold in countless eco-dystopian films, uh, as well as in the present state of police violence and military brutality as contested by the international Black Lives Matter movement and the indigenous resurgence as exemplified in the Standing Rock protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Or, alternately, the formation of relocalized, sustainable cultures based on renewable energy systems, degrowth and redistributive ec economics, climate justice, regional sovereignty, rights of nature, and new forms of human and even interspecies political inclusion and post-capitalist democratic practice. While that latter scenario may seem more challenging than ever today, and politically beyond reach at present, it is in fact the belief that we can carry on according to the status quo without changes to our social, political, economic, and environmental systems that is truly delusional. It becomes clear as Daniel Hartley argues, that at its outer limit, ecological struggle is nothing but the struggle for universal emancipation. If the capitalist scene sanctions a more directed address of an intervention into the processes and causes of current ecological violence, the numerous artistic activist practices are already providing proposals that insist on embedding experimental visual culture within social engagements and collaborative social movements that are posed against the Anthropocene. They're doing so in order to foster creative forms of life, joining survival to cultural resilience, indigenous sovereignty to multi-species composition, democratic practice to ecolo to economic justice and ecological sustainability, which hope to overcome what Haraway calls the Anthropocene killing of ongoingness. In this sense, ecology takes on the guise of intersectionality, where the, um, the methodology of analysis necessitates new pedagogies of practice and learning, which must be waged on multiple simultaneously interconnected levels. Let me identify a few further examples in conclusion. One model is Ursula Biemann and Paolo Tavares's Forest Law from 2014, a video and mixed media installation 
that investigates the history of destructive oil extraction in the Ecuadorian Amazon as well as indigenous resistance and environmental activism and legal proposals for transformative justice. Between 1964 and 1992, Texaco, before it merged into Chevron in 2001, dumped approximately 18 billion gallons of toxic wastewater in the tropical rainforest. The Deepwater Horizon spill, by contrast, was roughly 200 million gal gallons of oil. The result has plagued local communities with the slow violence of increased rates of cancer and miscarriages, immune system deficiencies, and other serious health problems. The organization Amazon Watch described the pollution as one of the worst environmental disasters on the planet. Biman and Tavares's project, which also includes research material presented as a small catalog, details the struggle of the Shuar and Saryaku peoples for justice through laws newly enshrined in Ecuador's constitution that protect, protect the rights of nature. That struggle amounts to a revolutionary juridico-political movement prioritizing ecocentric legality in places like Ecuador and Bolivia, which are vanguard in what is the growing international movement in earth jurisprudence. Indeed, indigenous nations comprise part of the 30,000 people in this Amazon region who have filed a lawsuit against Chevron recently in 2001, for which they were awarded 18 billion US dollars in cleanup costs and damages in Ecuadorian courts, a sum reduced to 9.5 billion on appeal. While the American corporation has had the verdict overturned in an American court, the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague has recently upheld the Ecuadorian judgment. Investigating this intersection of ecocentric legality, environmental reparation, and indigenous rights, Biman and Tavares's forest law exemplifies the ecological commitments of growing number of artists and activists exploring the structural conditions of capitalism's colonization of nature, such as the collective platform World of Matter, of which Biman and Tavares are both members, and it parallels the growing um, number of transnational alliances in civil society facilitated by new media ecologies seeking to establish sovereign and environmental rights from Argentina to the Arctic. Another example that reinvents the conditions of visuality in relation to capitalistine violence is the recent work of the Finnish artist Terika Hapoja in collaboration with the writer Laura, Laura Gustafsson, which attempts also to realize the cultural terms of a post-anthropocentric form of life. With their project History of Others, the pair have developed a complex series of proposals for an interspecies cosmopolitics, an alternative post-anthropocentric world-making practice of human and non-human relations, mediated by images, performances, imaginary institutions, and diverse social agents. A number of works constitute this project. First, they initiated the Party of Others, an interspecies political organization to compete in Helsinki's 2011 parliamentary elections with an expanded human-animal constituency, approximating the terms of what R Rosie Bredodi calls Zoe-centered egalitarianism, meaning an inclusive post-anthropocentric legal political equality among species. Second, they produced the Museum of the History of Cattle, assembling artifacts, historical information, and photographic documents presented from the vantage of cows. And third, they modeled a court of law capable of hearing testimony from non-human agents, such as wolves and prosecuting people for cross-species crimes, where hunters can be charged with murder. This work may be speculative, but it begins to map the juridico-political terrain of a post-Anthropocene future. Lastly, consider Climate Games, a climate justice action adventure grant game uh, initiated by the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination. Based in, uh, in Brittany in France, the collective, including the activist artists Isabel Frémaux and John Jordan, 
has been working over the last decade at the intersection of climate justice, activism, permaculture gardening, radical theater, and experimental projects in anti-capitalist collective living. In the fall of 2015, Climate Games intervened in and contested the anti-democratic power of multinational corporations in determining the agenda of the UN Climate Change Conference meeting in Paris. The project represented a transnational experiment in horizontalist and rebellious movement building, where visual elements, including satellite-generated maps, computerized graphics, cell phone images, technical and tactical information, were shared through internet-linked media networks, all elements supported and embedded in the movements of insurgent bodies on the streets of Paris, comprising an eco-activist challenge to global climate governance. Working in solidarity with diverse formations of the global blockadia movement, positioned against oil pipelines and fossil fuel machinery, the artwork as mass mobilization invited semi-autonomous participating activists all over the world, as in this case in Germany, to coordinate creative political interventions and nonviolent civil disobedience and compete for climate games awards by registering and documenting their activities on a networked website. Resonating with ultra-globalization forces, Occupy, and the Spanish Indignado tactics, their modeling of a neo-Brechtian performance of disruption, as well as a kind of neo-Boalian invisible theater that takes place seemingly spontaneously in everyday life, intended to intensify the joy of disobedience, to stop this suicidal machine that has literally set the climate on fire and has led to the extinction of 200 species per day. Their Thulusin-like motto was, we are nature defending itself. One amazing convergence of artist-activist energies occurred alongside climate games, joining together groups including the United States based Gulf, Not an Alternative, and Occupy Museums, and the United Kingdom's Art Not Oil, BP or Not BP, Liberate Tate, and Platform London. They created an international coalition to contest capitalist scene environmental economics and cultural policy. Strategizing together, they held an unauthorized demonstration at the Louvre in 2015, attacking the flagship museum's sponsorship by major oil and gas corporations like Total. The event was particularly courageous given that public gatherings were considered illegal in the context of France's declared state of emergency following the Paris terrorist attacks half a month earlier, a declaration particularly anti-democratic and that it allowed the depoliticized activities of shopping and sports games to continue uninterrupted. Outside the museum's iconic glass pyramids on December 9, performers carried black umbrellas spelling out the words fossil-free culture and spoke of their support for life beyond petrocapitalism. At the same time, a smaller group created the scene of what appeared to be a small oil spill in the atrium of the museum and then proceeded to walk through it barefoot and then around in concentric circles, their footprints on the marble floor visualizing fossil fuel corporations' despoilment of the museum and more broadly, the environment. What we witness with climate games and the larger civil society movement of which it formed a part is a shift in artic artistic practice toward an engaged creativity directed at challenging the very structures of climate governance and finance, including the political economy of cultural institutions. The momentum continues to grow, just as interventions are becoming more bold. Earlier in March 2015, Not an Alternatives, the Natural History Museum project, organized an open letter to museums signed by nearly 150 scientists, including several Nobel Prize winners calling on American museums to cut all ties with the fossil fuel industry and funders of climate science obfuscation. Generating copious press coverage, the letter was likely a major factor in oil air industrialist David Koch leaving the board of New York's American Museum of Natural History in January of 2016. 
an instance of what not an alternative have come to call institutional liberation, its practice moves beyond earlier forms of institutional critique, focused on the critical analysis of institutional functions, and toward emancipation of such spaces from petrocapitalist influence, social and economic injustice, and anti-democratic rule. At, a bit, at about the same time, Liberate and other London-based groups won a nearly six-year campaign uh, after many unauthorized creative direct, direct actions to compel the Tate to break off its sponsorship agreements with BP, thereby removing the corporation's ability to artwash its identity and practice, that is, make an environmentally destructive business appear as a benevolent cultural philanthropist, securing a social license to pollute. The goal of these groups is to reinvent democratic self-determination and support fossil-free culture through direct action, through the creative design of activist interventions, by contesting corporate power and its nefarious sway over public institutions. In other words, these practitioners are opposing the current petrocapitalist governmentality, the rule of the capitalist xenologists that attempts to unilaterally decide how we address environmental crisis, a threat like no other, as complex and interconnected as it is singularly grave and consequential. New media ecologies, climate games, institutional liberation, these are diverse engagements for sure, and there are certainly many, many more worthy of attention. What they generally share is taking a stake in anti-Anthropocene cultural practice, founded upon the refusal to generalize and depoliticize climate change agency and the rejection of current corporate-dominated environmental governance. They each invent creative approaches to alternative forms of life beyond the Anthropocene's techno-fixes and geo geoengineering ambitions, and they also propose different design initiatives for alternative ways to organize government and create different kinds of economies. For they prefer to address only the cons for these problems of techno fixes and geoengineering, prefer to address only the consequences rather than interrogate the systemic processes of centuries of capitalism's world historical and colonial co-becoming with nature. As Roy Scranton observes, if you want to live to learn if you want to learn to live in the Anthropocene, we must first learn how to die. Learning how to die means giving up on carbon-fueled capitalism and its techno-utopian ideologues, who have promised infinite growth and infinite innovation, yet have proven incapable of saving us from the disaster they have made. It is precisely such an, an abandonment of the Anthropocene's ideas, stories, and practices that the above engaged artists have initiated. The transversal connections between politicized collectives and their rebellious poetics disperse, for sure, into countless names, the emergent lexicons of current geologies and p potential futures now in the making. Whether they will be enough to stop the ravages of the coming climate catastrophe, even when they join with the power of growing social movements, is another question. But what other choice do we have? My task now to give a quick response to uh, to a lecture uh, that I must say I actually totally agree with. So <laughs> it's not that I'm going to raise two or three points of criticism towards what he's uh, proposing here, except for maybe one thing that I am much less likely to uh, want to get rid of the word Anthropocene. I would like to also by going back maybe to uh, when the term was actually proposed uh, in, in the first place by Paul Kutzen and afterwards how it was being taken up in the field of the humanities and also in the arts, it was a sign of resistance. And um, by simply 
letting it go and say the Anthropocene is hijacked by the geoengineers, the Anthropocene is now only the good Anthropocene, as T.G. Lemus a bit um, um, does in this lecture in any case, is I think too easy. Also because the Anthropocene is here to stay. Um, and um, just at the moment also when it is beginning to get a voice or beginning to be used in uh, even mainstream media. So I think it was yesterday when I got uh, the, just the general newsletter of Blendel and there it had one item which was on the Anthropocene. So the editorial board of Blendel, like this, this gathering thing of Dutch newspapers and uh, things. It's interesting enough for the whole majority of the of the Dutch population to be interested in this, just as well, any sort of news or no news, non-news. Um, so for me still, and that's maybe is also um, due to my involvement in Sonic X and Dark Ecology, where also we have been using the idea of the Anthropocene is to hold on to it as um, as something which signifies a resistance, a resistance to a specific idea of what human is and a resistance exactly to human exceptionalism. Um, so how it was, of course, how it was proposed uh, was to show us Westerners or anyone in the world that uh, the way in which we have been dealing with the Earth and our approach to uh, to the Earth has had has is having some terrible consequences, not so much for the Earth, but for our human civilization. So it's not. I mean, it's not about all of these ecological art. is not about saving the Earth. The Earth will take care of itself. It will still exist in a billion years from now. Um, and of course. Some of the things in nature will change, but there's been extinction events before. No, it is about survival of a specific human civilization that has some good things that we might want to hold on to. It's about making sure that our kids and the kids of our kids, kids and the kids of our kids will still have some sort of an okay existence in this world. And that the world as we know it will not be ravaged by wars, terrible crisis, um, millions of people dead, etc., etc. So I think that's the um, the sort of things that sort of things that we're looking at here. Um, so I totally agree with all of the criticisms that are raised towards uh, the word Anthropocene and all of the failings of the word as well, because it has catched on too easily as the age of man, which to many people when they first hear it signifies, oh the age of man, so we have triumphed. Uh, no, it's not that, we failed, that's what it means. Um, the next idea is then the good Anthropocene is, okay, so we failed, but wait a minute, if we just have a bit better technology, technology which is a little bit more ecological, we can still fix it. But well, I don't think that the Anthropocene, or what the sort of nerve that the Anthropocene touches, is about that at all. That's a very superficial understanding of the changes that actually I think we're going through. The changes that we're going through are, in a sense, much more fundamental than that. It's about really changing our idea of how humans are connected to non-humans, to the Earth, to nature, and how there is this, what well, we could say, symbiosis of these, uh, this mesh that we're in, to mention a word, or, or use a word that Timothy Morton uh, uses. But it's also all the things that Haraway points out uh, at, in our book, uh, Staying with the Trouble, um, including the idea that it's not all global, but it's very much about the local um, connections as well, or especially local connections. And it's not just any connection specific connections, it's about specificity. Um, so for me, still the Anthropocene is this moment that signifies this understanding that a sort of 
uh, modernistic way of approaching the earth and this idea that you have nature on the one side as something which is not changing and human culture on the other side which is kind of master of the earth and uh, has this dynamic culture and makes all these things happen that that one is wrong so it connects also to this much longer uh, reconsideration of terms like nature and culture um, in, which is going on in philosophy that's also where the thought of Latour is very much connected to this. And I see that she's already here and saying that I almost have to <laughs> one shut minute up. Left. <laughs> so I'd like to put one more thing into the mix here. And um, <coughs> that is, or maybe two, <laughs> when I can. One is uh, the sort of reconsideration <coughs> of our, our thinking of our ontology. Um, you have this nice book by uh, Descola, the French anthropologist. It's kind of structural anthropology, so it's not. But you don't necessarily have to agree with her, with his sketch of uh, of anthropology and how he wants to go there. But his idea, what he very forcefully shows, is that he makes this uh, system of four basic ontologies: animism, naturalism, totemism, analogism, analogism which is about how we connect to, to the things around us and if there's a difference. Animism, for instance, it says that things can have a soul just as human beings can have a soul, and animals can have a soul. Totemism does this, does this differently again. And Western naturalism, of course, says that things don't have a soul, we have a soul. Um, but one thing which struck me in reading this book a couple of years ago is that it makes your view of our Western naturalistic ontology or Western naturalistic view of of the world may just seem just as strange as animism or analogism. Totemism is a bit more stranger. So it makes what this opens up is also um, this going away from uh, all of these ways to think about the world that we have inherited from our education and from 400 years of Western philosophy and maybe put in one more thing and that is sort of how also all the uh, things that we learn from science, Western science, uh, informs this. One of the things is that we know about climate change and how that is transforming the world is thanks to, is thanks to science. The other thing is all the, the, the crazy changes in biology and in our thinking in biology, something at which I'm not really know a lot about. But I'm always very struck by the totally different way in which we need to think now about bacteria. I'm from an age when I learned at school that you had to wash your hands really good because it's bacteria on your hands and don't stick your finger in your mouth. That's not even what they learn at school anymore. Don't wash your hands too well because the bacteria will die. That's what they learn at school now. And that's what in the children's book there. So, just to end on a, on a positive note there. Some of the things uh, things is, are changing. So I don't know if we're yes, yes. not going to do a discussion now. I'm or? afraid we don't have time. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, we, we have to also Chessa make sure you get a say later on as well. And uh, we hopefully we can remember all the things that TJ Demos uh, said here for. Uh, discussions we will have, which we will have in uh, the coming hours and tomorrow. Thank you.